So I repeat, this is the 14th Joe Parima camp. 14th every year. Uh, it is a well-established tradition uh, that I deliver the state of geopolymer research and development. Each year, I do a selection of what I consider being valuable to highlight uh, since the last geopolymer camp. It is always interesting to show how it was at the beginning. Here we have uh, uh, the geopolymer research in 1988 at our first geopolymer conference at the University of Technology in Compiègne in France. And here it is our, well, what I could find, there are more, I am sure, working on the topic. It is self-evident that uh, the increase in the number of laboratory means an increase in the number of scientific publication. Uh, the first year, from 1991 onwards, with my reference publication, quoted uh, thousands of times, there is uh, one or three publications uh, per year, and then it starts gently to rise. In 2008, we published our first geopolymer book. Now we have the fifth edition since 2020. The state of the geopolymer uh, research and development for this year has uh, three parts. First, geopolymer science. Second, uh, global warming, sustainable production of electricity with microbial fuel cells. And B, solar power technologies. And third, geopolymer and archaeology, update of research on Easter Island statues manufacture so first, uh, geopolymer science. In April 2020, we released uh, the fifth edition of my standard book, Geopolymer Chemistry and Applications. Uh, in addition to the numerous updates, this fifth edition adds two new chapters. Uh, chapter 11, Ferrocylid Geopolymers. This is the very important chapter. This is for me for the future for buildings application. Chapter 21, how to quantify and develop geopolymer formulas. These, uh, these last new chapters details how to select raw materials, how to calculate a formula, the description of the process method for optimal results, and all in a very pragmatic way. This is what we have done yesterday. Uh, it is complicated, it seems to be complicated, it's very easy, but you have to follow these rules. <clears throat> we have also a new geopolymer bundle for newcomers, which replaces the former one. It includes an experimental uh, part, totalizing three hours of videos taken during the tutorial workshop of the geopolymer camp. At the first Geopolymer Camp 2009, I listed 16 research topics. Since then, uh, you can witness uh, the progress made each year in any past keynotes on research and development. Those selected this year are highlighted in blue color. Polymeric character of geopolymer. This is a topic that is very important. It is a polymer. What type of polymer? Uh, these are polysilic siloxonate, these are the soluble silicate, no news, or maybe yes from Werner, but I have, I have no idea. Uh, Metacarline based ferrocylate geopolymer, calcium based geopolymer, rock based geopolymer, silica based geopolymer, fly ash based geopolymer, phosphate based geopolymer. You see, there is not one polymer, there are so many. Organic mineral geopolymer. Long-term durability, this is uh, archaeology, uh, geopolymer fiber composites, geopolymer in ceramic processing, we have a very small presentation uh, tomorrow. Uh, the manufacture of geopolymer cements, for me, we should no longer use fly ash. 
uh, geopolymer concrete, material for radioactive waste, and 3D printing. First, the polymeric character of geopolymers. Uh, in 1975, 1976, when I first presented the concept of mineral polymer, the mainstream of the scientists could not imagine that polymers existed outside of the well plowed area of organic polymers. Polymers were only organic. organic. I had difficulties in introducing this term, but I continued. I resisted, and this is now well established. The geopolymerization mechanism includes uh, six steps. First, alkalination. We don't have the word alkali activation. Even if you find in my first papers, I write uh, alkali activation, something like, because at the beginning, uh, I had really no precise knowledge of uh, what I should present in terms of theoretical background for uh, this uh, uh, new chemistry. But it is alkalination. So each time I read alkali activation in a paper, I stop reading and uh, go to the next one. Depolymerization of silicates, gel formation of oligosilates, polycondensation, reticulation, networking, geopolymer solidification. Here we start on step four, squared oligomers. This is the first real step. The monomers, the first step is a squared oligomers made of three SI and one AL. This is the chemistry. And this polycondensed into a ribbon a long 2D chain that copoly condensed to form a three-dimensional network. Again, with the help of the cations, the NaOH and the KOH, uh, carried out by water, which will link other oligomers together until it is trapped in step five. In st with time or temperature, the silanol SiOH reacts with L plus, LQ plus, building the SiOAL bridge. This is the most important silate bridge, bridge or silate link. Water is expelled from the structure, yielding the final 3D, three-dimensional structure on step six. But this is not the end. So this is the real structure of a geopolymer macromolecule. And this has been proven by analysis. This has been proven by nuclear magnetic resonance. This is the end of the solidification of geopolymer. But this is not the end. Professor Creven, my friend from the US at University of Illinois, investigated in 2003 transmission electron microscopy, the microstructure of fully reacted geopolymers. She found that it consists of nanoparticulates. So you see on the, uh, the arrow, at the end of the arrow, at the tip of the arrow, very individual small spheres, 5 to 15 nanometers in dimension, separated by nanoporosity whose features are in the order of 3 to 10 nanometers. These are the macromolecules of a polysilate siloxo type. It is the accumulation of these nanoparticulates or individual particulates that forms the geopolymer matrix. The polymeric phase is made of nano and or submicron almost spherical particulates, which we call geopolymeric micelles. The figure shows the very small dimension 
of the geopolymer nanoparticulate, geopolymer mysol, when compared to other spherical structures like colloid, soli colloid silicate, silica fume, and fly ash. Geopolymer is a nanomaterial. It is not an unknown gel. Another view from Dr. Gong Jung Seo from the Arizona State University in the USA. See uh, the nano aggregates during uh, reticulations. Look at the scale, 20 nanometers. So the uh, dimensions of the particulates are in the 10 nanometers range. Let's observe the intermicellar structure. Here, so we have the two micelles, 10 nanometers, and in between, we have the water. The water, H2O, uh, has been expelled in step six during the geopolymerization. The water was used to carry out uh, sodium or well, potassium cation. Once it is done, the excess of water evaporates. When it evaporates, it leaves voids, porosity, that can induce cracks or shrinkage. To prevent from any damages caused to the geopolymer product, fine fillers must be added to the recipe and will fill the gap left between the geopolymer micelles. A geopolymer is not a resin. It is never used alone. It is a binder for mineral fillers. This unique structural characteristic of geopolymers is now becoming one of the basic tools in the setup of advanced geopolymer formulations for example, for 3D printing, also called additive manufacturing. For example, in this paper published in 2021, titled Direct Ink Writing of Geopolymer with High Special Resolution and Tunable Mechanical Properties by a Chinese team around Dejang Gia from the Harbin University Institute of Technology in China. I read the abstract. Direct ink writing of geopolymers with desirable patterns, compositions, and properties hold great promise for sustainable concrete, porous absorbent, and high temperature ceramic. However, precisely constructing geopolymer by DIW is subject to the low viscosity of geopolymer inks and the limited choice of alkali metal ions. I continue. We produce high quality sodium, potassium, cesium based geopolymer inks by adding suitable additives, yielding complex patterns with high special resolution and controllable mechanical properties. Furthermore, we reveal the mechanism underlying the fracture behavior of the 3D printed geopolymers, combining compression tests, theoretical models, and electron microscopy and analysis. Our results pave the way for designing high quality geopolymer-based materials, which are critical for industrial applications and sustainable development. What are the explanations? This is what they have done. You see at the scale, five millimeter, 10 millimeters, or 20 millimeters. The explanation is based on the geopolymer micelle that I presented earlier. So here we have the pure resin with 1.25% additive, no mineral fillers. So you'll see all the opening holes that are in the matrix. And they explain here with uh, the geopolymer micelle model that is in blue, the small particulates that have 10 nano 
millimeters in diameter. Uh, they are named here HJ, HGP for hydrated geopolymer particulate. Uh, the explanation is based on the geopolymer Mysol model. Uh, they add a secret additive, Triton. Uh, I tried to, uh, to understand what is exactly the Triton. It is a Chinese product, so there is no information. Uh, to encapsulate uh, the geopolymer micelles, which do not reticulate between each other. They are separated with water. They call the geopolymer micelles hydrated geopolymer particulates. Now, uh, they added more from this Triton, 3.75%, uh, and a mineral filler, 8% kaolin. Kaolin, very fine in particulates, not metakaolin. The metakaolin was used to make the resin. Here it is pure kaolin. It becomes uh, more densely packed with encapsulation of both the geopolymer micelle and the lamella kaolin, which is now located between the particulate. Remember, in between, and then this is strong. There's no cracks, there's nothing. So one needs fine fillers, but not any kind of filler. Indeed, uh, since the time I had discovered geopolymer chemistry in 1975-76, I noticed that the addition of carbon or graphite at a ratio higher than 1.5% by weight to mix was detrimental to the final mechanical strength. This is because the carbon elements were located outside of the geopolymer micelle and were preventing the formation of any cross-linking between the particulates, which are on the exterior surface of the geopolymer micelles. But this major drawback is now providing excellent properties in terms of electrical conductivity with conductive graphite particulates. Let's observe the intermicellar structure, but here with inclusion of graphite particulates. Depending on the graphite dimension, we obtain a continuous electrical conductivity which is essential to the implementation of the very promising sustainability production of electricity, namely the microbial fuel cells technology. I introduce now the second part of my keynote. Global warming, sustainable production of electricity. As you know, planet Earth is now subject to extreme heat and dryness climate. We had record heat practically everywhere, record rain in Germany, Belgium, and so forth. I already presented in my keynotes 2020 and 2021 the catastrophic fires in Australia, in California, in Turkey, and so on. A continent is on fire. Both Australia and California have never experienced such an inferno. More and more citizens blame the climate change, CO2 emissions responsible for this, essentially from the burning of coal of the power plants. Instead of coal or gas, do implement the sustainable production of electricity with geopolymer technology. First, microbial fuel cells. Second, solar power energy. Microbial fuel cells are one of the most promising technologies for sustainable energy generation from a variety of waste water streams but capital expenditures have stopped its implementation on a larger scale. A recent published study conducted by two German research groups from 
Technical University in Darmstadt and the Hema Research Institute in Frankfurt demonstrate that geopolymer graphite composite anodes result in equal current production when compared to the conventional graphite anodes. The presentation uh, by Niven Ukrainsik here is scheduled for this morning after the coffee break related to this publication, Conductive Geopolymers at Low Cost Electrode materi Materials for Microbial Fuel Cells. Geobacter sulfuredutsens was used as electroactive bacteria. The geopolymer graphite composite anode respiring biofilms resulted in electrical current production equal to the conventional graphite anode, whereas Portland's graphite composite showed a very poor performance, practically zero. They added only 8 to 10 percent per volume of graphite, which are equivalent to pure graphite. The largest mean value of the measured current density of a geopolymer carbon composite used as anodes in microbial cells was 3.8 ampere per square meters. The pictures show the electricity production. This is the current density on the, and that with the time in hours, but here we can have one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, continuous. With uh, this constant pro electricity production, imagine the following scenario. 70 years ago, until the 1960s, each town was producing its own city gas, or for domestic use, as well as for industrial use. Those who have my age or a little younger remember this. A gas plant was the factory producing manufactured gas or city gas, generally from coal. The gas industry expanded rapidly in Europe and USA in the 19th and 20th century. Large scale factories in the city landscape left their marks on the collective imagination with the immense cylindrical metal structures called gasometers, necessary for the storage of the city gas. This was replaced by natural gas. Now imagine that each city would transform its sewage and waste water treatment plant into giant geopolymer microbial fuel cells. Because of the huge volume, the high surface of structural elements such as wastewater, sewage pipes, tanks, and concrete structures. So this integration concept would enable a cost-effective solution of high capacity of electrical power generation in every town or every village. This is uh, what I would like uh, you to have in mind for the very next future. I guess you will discuss this possibility after the presentation by Dr. Neven Ukrainczyk. It will be recorded and the video put online at the Geopolymer Camp 2022 page and in our YouTube chain. Second, solar power technologies. Solar furnaces are of two types. One big mirror, like the one in France, and multiple mirrors, like uh, the one in Spain. We have an equivalent close to Las Vegas in the USA. I found this paper, 2022, Geopolymer Concrete Performance Study for High Temperature Thermal Energy Storage Applications. For me, a uh, better title would have been uh, Geopolymer Concrete for High Temperature Thermal Energy Storage 
in solar power technologies. <clears throat> solar energy is an energy intermittent source that faces a challenge for its power dispatchability. Hence, concentrating solar power plants employ thermal energy storage technologies. Ordinary Portland cement-based materials are limited to operation temperature below 400 degrees C because of thermal degradation processes. Geopolymer-based concrete is a sound choice due to its thermal energy storage capacity, high thermal diffusion, and capability to work at high temperature regimes in the 600-700 degrees C range. So we have here on the, in blue, Portland cement with temperature, compressive strength. In the 600-700 degree range, Portland cement is no longer used. It has exp exploded, whereas geopolymer concrete in brown is, retains its high mechanical properties. Third part, I now turn to our research on the making of the Easter Island statues out of artificial stone. Uh, I had started this research 50 years ago in 1972. Just a brief summary. Uh, in 1974, I went to UNESCO in Paris and I obtained a copy of the report written by Giselle Hivert in 1973. Giselle Hivert was a French scientist who worked in the laboratory of cryptogamy at the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. In the UNESCO report, Giselle Hivert analyzed several samples taken from the broken statues of the Ao Tongariki in 1973, she writes, at the base of this opal white layer that are on uh, the statues, that is inside, below the surface of the rock, there is a particular abundance of small rectangular or diamond shapes, sometimes in the shape of barrels, which appear to be microorganisms or residue or fragment of macro-organisms. However, it should be pointed out that these macro-organisms, so these are the, the small items, are fossilized. No living micro-organisms were found in the sample I examined. The barrel-shaped fossilized macro-organisms bacteria, to my knowledge, no scientist has ever commented on this UNESCO report and consequently it is unknown. I kept this information for 48 years in order to use it in due course, that is, now. The Moai, that is the statue at Awitongariki, are made of volcanic stone. If the stone is a natural volcanic stone, it cannot contain these fossilized microorganisms located inside of it. We can only conclude that uh, this stone is artificial and that the microorganisms were introduced during its manufacture, then they became fossilized at the time of the hardening of the geopolymeric volcanic stone. There are several scientific clues demonstrating this possibility. I shall present the results of the preliminary research undertaken on several scientific data available and often misinterpreted, which shows the artificial nature of the Easter Island statues. They also demonstrate the interrelationship between South America and Easter Island. 
So this is the end of my uh, state of the art for this year. Mm -hmm.